good afternoon. My name is Edward Abrahams. I'm president of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. For those of you joining us for the first time, PMC is an education and advocacy organization whose mission is to advance what we call personalized medicine. In a nutshell, personalized medicine in combination with an understanding of the patient's values, history, and circumstances links sophisticated diagnostics to therapy in order to get better outcomes for patients and also to make health systems more efficient. When we organized this seminar, COVID-19 and personalized medicine, current status and lessons learned some months ago, we had hoped we might be able to look at the disease in the rear view mirror. That disappointment notwithstanding, we also wanted to call attention to how the principles of personalized medicine can play an important role in improving our understanding of the pandemic and therefore its treatment. Suffice it to say, this is a timely topic. Testing can inform public policies regarding, for example, reopening some work environments and not others. In addition, recognizing that different populations are impacted differently by the disease, treatments could and should be developed that account for those differences, as they do, for example, with AIDS patients. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do on multiple fronts. We are delighted to have first former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb to help sort out these issues for us, followed by a panel of PMC board members whose expertise cuts across multiple stakeholder groups from around the world. I wanna take a moment before we begin to thank some people who helped make this seminar possible. First and foremost, I wanna thank CNBC reporter Meg Terrell for agreeing to moderate it. Her background as a preeminent journalist in healthcare is unsurpassed. We are particularly pleased that she was willing to help us understand these issues and their significance in real time, as I know she will. I also want to thank Chris Wells, PMC Vice President for Public Affairs, who working with the entire PMC staff organized the seminar, along with our colleagues at Ogilvy, who have provided the necessary technical and other support, without which we would not have managed to bring together the nearly 400 people from across the globe so seamlessly, or I should hope, or I should say, hopefully seamlessly. And with that as an introduction, let me turn the Zoom over to Meg. Well, thanks so much, Ed, and looking forward to this panel discussion and, and hopefully to being back together uh, at some point. And maybe we'll get to some predictions about when that might happen uh, in the course of this discussion. I'm really excited to kick off this chat with Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Um, who has been a sort of constant voice for us in helping us understand this pandemic. Um, and Scott, you know, thinking about the title of, of this seminar, Current Status and Lessons Learned, maybe we could start by, by talking about that current status. I mean, if you look at where we are here in the beginning of September, we have treatments uh, for COVID-19. We are getting close to potentially hearing about the efficacy of some of the vaccines in phase three trials. Um, our case numbers are in a trough, although there's still almost 40,000 a day in the United States. Um, I'd be curious to know, do you think our situation right now is getting better or is it getting worse? Well, thanks for having me, Meg. The situation is definitely getting better. Um, you know, cases are declining. And I think when you're, when you're sort of accelerating, you always have more cases than what you're measuring. When you're decelerating, you always have probably fewer cases and less infection than what you're measuring because there's a lagging effect both on the way up and on the way down. Um, but the challenge is that we're taking a lot of infection into the fall. Um, many of us, I thought that July and August would be relatively quiescent. I think that the kinds of epidemics that we saw in the Sunbelt states were unexpected. Um, I was saying, you know, back in May that I thought maybe we would bounce around. We sort of plateaued at around 20,000 infections a day. I thought maybe we would sort of plateau there and take that through the summer, which seemed like a lot of infection. But heading into the fall with the amount of infection we have around the country, as we reopen schools, as residential college campuses go back into session, people 
are trying to get back to work. And I think people are exhausted and are going to become a little bit more complacent um, or a little bit take a little bit more risk in, in their um, daily lives. As we take that scenario into the fall with a respiratory pathogen that wants to spread in the fall and the winter, um, that is typically a seasonal pathogen, I think that there's a lot of risk that we're going to see increased infections and you know, we may have reached the low point right now, and it's only going to be um, upward from here as we get into September. That's my concern. And when you look around the country, um, when you break out the Northeast and the Sunbelt states from the rest of the country, what you see is obviously um, flat infection in the Northeast, uh, declining, sharply declining infection in the South, but rising infection everywhere else. And it's mostly accounted for by the Midwest and the West. And it's a lot like the scenario back in May and June when you looked at the national trends and infections were coming down nationally and it looked favorable. But when you broke out in New York, New York was declining very quickly and they had accounted for most of the infection in the country, but the South was slowly rising and um, New York, the New York declines were masking that rise in the South. You're seeing the same phenomenon right now with the, the West and the Midwest. And that's the concern, I think, that, that you're setting up a scenario that as you head into the fall, you could see more diffuse, a more diffuse epidemic that's more distributed across the United States rather than this regionalized, these regionalized epidemics that we've had to date. And as we see these patterns unfolding, a lot of people point to the fact that we need a national approach to this as we head into the fall. And you know, I, I would love to just sort of get your thoughts on what that national communication has looked like and what's happened to it really even just over the last week or so. If you look at the, the FDA, they of course granted emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine and then rescinded it. And now uh, have really gotten themselves into hot water over their comments and Dr. Stephen Hahn's comments about convalescent plasma, really overstating them. And then the NIH came out and said the data behind convalescent plasma don't support its use in COVID-19. So you're observing this splintering of the government and there is just huge concern about trust in our institutions as we start to approach potentially more cases and the use of vaccines Harold Varmus, the former NIH director, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying, ignore the CDC. This is unbelievable during a pandemic. I mean, how do you look at that? And can this administration win back the trust of the public? Well, I'll take the second question second. Uh, you know, on the issue of a national plan, we don't have a national plan. We're not going to have a national plan. What you have is state-based plans producing regionalized effects. And I think that that's, that's the inevitability here. You're starting to see states come together in cooperatives around certain issues like trying to get testing. And I think you're going to see more of that kind of cross-state collaboration. And you're going to see states certainly collaborate on a regionalized basis, like you've seen with the tri-state region where New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut have had joint decision-making. That's likely to be only certain regions and certain states where you see that kind of behavior. But for the most part, um, these are state-based policies and you're seeing uh, more regionalized effects across the country. And I don't think that's going to change. And, and if, you know, if you think about it, if you had a more um, coordinated plan across the country, you could actually, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be to be more restrictive, it would actually be to be more enabling. And if you think back to the early days of this pandemic, when we put in place a synchronized national shutdown, um, you know, if we had had the tools to know actually where this virus was spreading, and we didn't have them, people who are critical of the lockdowns now, and, and, and sort of, you know, retrospectively judge the decisions we made in March, the reality was back in March, um, we had no idea where this was spreading because we didn't have a diagnostic test, which I think is going to be looked back upon as one of the really key failures here. And we had an epidemic in New York City that was so dense that New York City was on the brink of being overrun. And that healthcare system was almost brought to the brink of collapse, even with the extraordinary federal resources that were poured into the city. And at the time, we were looking at Detroit and New Orleans and Boston, and Chicago, and they looked equally worrisome in terms of the epidemics that were building in those cities. And I remember a conversation with someone very senior in the administration who said that if, if any of those other cities ends up becoming New York, falling like New York, there's not going to be enough federal resources to backstop it because they had forward deployed an enormous amount of resources into New York and just were tapped out at the federal level. And that, that reality drove a lot of the decision to do the, the national sort of shutdown order from the, from the White House, from the federal government. But in retrospect, had we had the tools and a, and a more coordinated national plan, um, we could have 
focused on the places where the virus was spreading. When you look back to the 2005, 2006 pandemic planning that was largely followed, that, that sort of enshrined mitigation as a tool for pandemic response, they never envisioned a national shutdown. What they envisioned was regionalized um, mitigation steps, social distancing um, in response to where the virus was spreading. But we didn't know where it was spreading. And I think it, it's emblematic of the fact that we really haven't had sort of the tools to do a coordinated um, federal response and, and really the coordination around the application of those tools. Um, you know, in terms of the plasma itself, I don't think that there was anything, there was nothing in the documents from FDA um, and from NIH that were in conflict with each other. Uh, if you look at the FDA EUA and the language of the EUA, it's actually very consistent with the language used in the NIH um, sort of guidelines that were posted. I think what people are reacting to isn't the way the decision was made by the professional staff by, F by FDA, but the way it was talked about um, beyond the, the decision made by the professional staff. And that's very different. And so it's not that the scientists are in conflict with each other around how they're judging the science and the conclusions that they're drawing. Um, it's that you're seeing um, certain policymakers uh, express and, and, and articulate and describe the science in ways that isn't consistent with the ways described in those documents. And that's, that's, that's very different. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of draw the conclusion that the agencies themselves are um, in conflict with each other around their adjudication of the science. So to the second part of that question about trust um, in the, the government response, um, tell us as your experience as FDA commissioner, how much autonomy, how much control did you really have? I mean, how much should people, the American public, be expecting the decisions about a vaccine, for example, to be made by Janet Woodcock and the people who've been there for a long time versus being made at the top by someone who, who appears to be making political statements uh, from the White House, uh, or at least be making statements that seem to, to be frankly, to, to make the president happy. I mean, that's what it appeared happened when Dr. Hahn was talking about the benefits of convalescent plasma. Well, look, I can't speak to what's going on now because I'm just not, I'm not involved in, um, you know, the decisions that getting made, obviously, and I'm not getting briefed on them. And I'm not having conversations with the folks who are involved. I have not talked to the FDA commissioner um, through this entire episode. So I just don't know um, what's going on. I can tell you that the way I viewed um, the agency and my job was to preserve the autonomy of the center directors to make their make decisions and um, elevate, you know, elevate the, the process itself. I think the process itself has uh, inherent integrity. The process itself is transparent. It's rigorous, it's codified in guidance and regulation, it's been enshrined in regulation and statute. Um, you know, the decision making chain in CBER around vaccines uh, has a lot of consistency and rigor to it. It goes through multiple layers of scientific review. Peter Marks has been doing this a long time. The people who head up the group have been doing this a long time. They've issued countless guidance documents that that sort of map out how they make decisions. They have an advisory committee process. And so I think the, the job of the commissioner is to preserve that process and preserve the autonomy of the Senate directors to make decisions. Yeah, you know, I, I, was, I was frankly very deferential to the Senate directors on issues of science and regulation. You know, where I, where I got involved um, and imparted my view was sometimes around how we approach Congress, sometimes how we approach the comms, um, you know, how we would roll out things, but the, the underlying decision, I wanted to preserve their, their autonomy and their prerogative. And that sometimes meant um, preserving it from other agencies as well, who had opinions about uh, decisions that we were making that were in conflict with my center directors. If, my, if, if I had a center director, if Janet Woodcock thought we should take a certain decision and someone else in the federal government disagreed, I certainly wanted to make sure that we, we heard that opinion and, and had the opportunity to consider it, but it was ultimately Janet Woodcock's decision. It was Peter Marks's decision. It was FDA's decision. We were the regulators. Um, and there were plenty of times that DOD and CDC around tobacco and other agencies had opinions about the decisions we were making, but they were our decisions. And I fought very hard to preserve those prerogatives. Um, and I feel I did. Uh, and, you know, and the other thing I tried to do was to take the agency's decisions out of 
uh, anything that could be perceived as a political context. I mean, I didn't, I didn't show up uh, on the podium. I didn't brief the press from the White House. Um, you know, when we made decisions around things, even that were um, important priorities for the administration, certainly I briefed the administration appropriately, but I would take the decisions at FDA. You know, when we announced our drug pricing um, actions or actions around opioids, we took those actions and we announced those actions inside the agency. Um, I can't think of a single time that I've ever briefed uh, from the White House uh, on any FDA decision it, publicly. Um, so, you know, the, those were conscious choices to try to preserve the perception of the FDA's prerogatives. I mean, I think that there's, there's two issues. There's the agency preserving its prerogatives, and then there's the issue of the agency preserving the perception of its prerogatives. And you can, you can preserve your autonomy and your prerogatives, but if you lose the perception around that, that could be just as harmful in terms of what it can do to public trust. So you have to focus on both. There's been a lot of conversation just in the last few days as we saw a letter uh, come out from Dr. Redfield at the CDC to governors, essentially asking them to make sure that they even you know, waived any sort of um, regulations that might block McKesson, its contracted vaccine distributor, uh, from being ready by November 1st. Um, we should obviously tell everybody you're on the board of Pfizer, which is uh, among the companies in the lead in vaccine development. Uh, and I think, you know, Dr. Borla, the CEO of Pfizer, just said this morning at a, um, an international pharma meeting that they've enrolled 23,000 participants in their trial out of 30,000 going ahead of schedule. And they expect to have data uh, by the end of October and potentially even file by then. Um, Looking at the entire field, not just Pfizer, um, what's your expectation of what the next few months look like in terms of getting data, uh, how the review will look, and potential authorizations? Yeah, and I don't necessarily think there was anything unusual about the CDC communication. Um, you know, we don't really have a precedent, so we, I, I can't say, well, well, this happens all the time. But it doesn't surprise me that CDC would be giving direction to the states to prepare plans for how they would distribute a vaccine um, well in advance of a vaccine being available. Um, you know, the, obviously the November 1st um, date piqued a lot of interest. I understand why, but you know, if it was November 5th, it would have probably piqued uh, interest too, or if it was September, you know, October 29th. Um, so I think it's prudent that CDC be doing that. In terms of how this is likely to unfold, you know, it's, and, and, and Albert, the CEO of Pfizer, I saw his comments this morning, and, and one of the things he, was, he said a few times was it's going to depend on the number of events um, in, the, in the trial itself, whether, whether or not you can get a readout in October or there's going to be a readout in, in, um, in November. I think the trials are enrolling at a very good pace. Um, the companies have been both Moderna and Pfizer have been public about that, and so that's sort of a check in the positive direction. I think one of the things that's going to weigh on the ability to get an earlier readout is what the rate of infection is. Um, you know, I, I unfortunately believe infections are going to pick up as we get into the fall, but they're declining right now. Um, and so, you know, you could have a slowdown in the number of events that you see in these trials, especially since a lot of these trials were enrolled in places in the country, Sunbelt states, where you see the most deceleration. Um, and so it could take a little longer to accrue those events. And the other thing is to have a readout in October, the vaccines need to be really effective. Morgan Stanley did a good report um, sort of analyzing this. And I think it's a very approachable report. I'd point people to it in early August, where they estimated that the vaccines would probably need to be 70 to 80% effective to have a readout in October. And if they're sort of in the 50 to 60% range, you'll get a readout in November. Um, you know, whether that those numbers are precise or they still are operative, given the fact that enrollment's gone well, I'm, I don't know. But but you you do have to have a situation where it's sort of priced for perfection, if you will. You, everything has to go right to get a top line readout in October. And it's certainly possible. Um, but I think if I was, you know, tr uh, if I was planning a public health response, I would sort of base my case. I'd have a base case that I'm not going to get top line data till November. And if we have an upside surprise and trials go really well, they enroll even faster. You have a lot of events, unfortunately, and the vaccines are really effective, you can get a top line result. The other, the other issue here is there's gonna be some proportion, some portion of patients 
that FDA is going to want at the very least one month and maybe two month follow up data on post the second dose. Um, and, you know, there's very specific reasons why they're going to want that. And so while you could have a lot of patients that have um, received the second dose and are beyond the two week window when they start recording events by the end of October, you have to ask how many patients will you have one month and two month follow up data on. And that, that, that'll turn on how many patients were dosed early uh, in you know, September or late August um, so that they've, they've had the first dose long enough to have received the second dose and then, and then be followed for a period of time after that. Um, and so you can start sitting down and doing the math on that based on what the companies have said about when, where they were in enrollment at different points in time. Um, and it's not an impossible scenario you can get data by the end of October. But I think, you know, it's, it's obviously a best case scenario uh, that you would have a readout by then. In terms of where we go from here, I, I do think the first availability of this vaccine is going to be emergency use authorization. I think it was always going to be that way. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The EUA is a lower standard, but it doesn't need to be a lower standard. It's a standard that gives the agency a lot of flexibility. They could hold these vaccines to the same kind of standard they would under a full approval, but just not go through all the same paperwork that they would in a full approval. So the EUA allows them to get the decision out sooner. The EUA also allows the agency to impose pretty aggressive post-market data collection requirements. And so I think the first authorizations could look very much like a registry where the agency, let's say, authorizes it for use by healthcare workers, but requires pretty rigorous data collection in the form of a registry among people who are the early people to get that vaccine. And that kind of a staged availability of the vaccine wouldn't, wouldn't be unlike a big vaccine development program. If you look back at like the um, vaccine development program for rotavirus, and I'm going to get this wrong because um, I don't remember the details, but there was something like 60,000 patients in that trial. And about half of them were in a, a placebo controlled arm. They were randomized to receive that vaccine. And in the other half, and I'm probably wrong on these numbers, but I'm just sort of throwing them out for, a, you know, illustration. The other half were in a re registry where you were just giving the vaccine to everyone. And so the idea was on the one half of the patients, the randomized portion, you're going to get a rigorous answer whether or not the vaccine works. You're going to get really good safety data against the placebo. And then in the other half, you're just trying to expose more people to the vaccine to build out your safety database. Well, the first availability of this vaccine under an EUA could be sort of thought of like an extension study where you're making it available, but you're collecting data. So I don't think that people... The, the reaction, you know, you look at Twitter and the reaction is if this is an EUA, it's going to be a lower standard. I don't think that needs to be the case. And I don't think that should be people's first reaction. I think we should wait and see what the agency actually does in the context of the EUA, because, you know, they could they could do a very staged availability. I don't want to use the word approval, but a staged market access here using the EUA process, which affords them that that flexibility where they make it available to successive cohorts of people who are initially at higher risk of bad outcomes or higher risk of infection, while they continue to allow the original data set to mature and collect additional data on those incremental patients. Mm. Well, I want to ask you if, you, if you don't mind, to try to make some predictions for us. Um, <laughs> You, know, you you joined us at CNBC, and, and Scott's a contributor at CNBC for, for folks who don't know. Um, you know, we had a special on the coronavirus going back to February, early February, and you were on with us every night, and you were right about a lot of things. So I feel okay asking you to make some predictions. When you think about the tools that, that we have now and that are being worked on, um, what do you think the next year looks like um, in terms of us making progress against this virus and when does life get back to normal and by normal i mean we all get to go to work maybe we don't have to wear masks i mean is this even realistic to think about well i think that there's going to be a new normal even after we kind of get the acute phase of coronavirus beyond us i think that we're going to we're going to all be a little bit more cautious about respiratory pathogens in the winter because this is still going to circulate even if, after we have a vaccine and people still aren't going to want to get it, and especially people who are vulnerable. And so I think that I think our habits are going to change. I think you're going to see much more, you know, use of masks in public. I think people aren't going to really like shaking hands in meetings. I think people are going to try to not crowd people into rooms. We're all going to feel a little icky about germs going forward. You can't spend a whole year living the way we are right now and not have some 
residual change in sort of our culture and our habits going forward. And I think you're going to see that. And they'll slowly be sanded away. But I don't think this generation's ever going to fully get beyond this in like the near term, the next two or three years. I think there's going to be some stuff that lingers with us. Just like, and I don't like making the comparison to 9-11, but just like after 9-11, there were certain mm -hmm. security features that stuck around. And there was certain a certain level of anxiety that remained for a period of time, even um, even to this day. Now, in terms of the near term, the epidemiologists are going to disagree with me, but I'll, I'll sort of give my my sort of a non-expert pro projections and predictions about where we end up. I think as we go through the fall and the winter, I think infections are going to pick up. In hospital mortality is clearly declining. We're getting much better treating this. Uh, treating this, Co doctors are much more confident. We'll keep the healthcare system from getting overburdened in a way that the healthcare system will get overwhelmed and exhausted. A vaccine will become available at some point. We'll start vaccinating people. So you know, people who are at high risk will will slowly start to get vaccinated over the course of the later part of 2020. Probably a winter event. The therapeutic antibodies will hopefully come into the market, which will provide you know greater assurance that we can rescue patients in the hospitalized settings. And frankly, by the end of the year, 20 to 30 percent of Americans will have been exposed to this. They'll either have a, had asymptomatic infection or they'll have had COVID disease um, just on sort of the current trajectory. So the combination of getting 20 to 30 percent of people infected, having a vaccine for some incremental portion of people, and everyone being a little bit more cautious about you know, respiratory pathogens, especially those who are most vulnerable, I think this make, it makes this a 2020 event. And I think as we get into 2021 and as we head into the spring, this just starts to decline on its own. And we have a relatively quiescent spring and summer. And then this wants to come back next year. But by next fall, we'll have a vaccine hopefully available for mass inoculation of the population. And we've largely made this a 2020 event, maybe with a tail into you know 2021 as you're getting out of the winter into the spring, this will still be with us. But we're in the pandemic phase right now. You know, people will argue, well, the pandemic phase is going to last two years. It's possible that the pandemic phase was really 2020. And as we get into 2021, this settles into a more seasonal pattern because of the technology we have that kind of accelerates our, our, our path through the pandemic phase of this, if you will, with the introduction of therapeutic antibodies um, and better diagnostics to be able to isolate people, point of care diagnostics, and then eventually a vaccine. So I'm hopeful that, you know, as we get through this winter and into March, into, you know, February, March, you start to see declines in the rate of infection and really sort of declining rapidly. And we get into March and April, and we kind of have this behind us. We're not back. We're, we're not going to, you know, go and crowd ourselves into, you know, uh, confined settings. And we're going to be a little bit more cautious. It's going to take time. But I think that we'll get this behind us. And by the time we get into a higher risk seasonal pattern going into the fall of 2021, we have a vaccine that's widely available. That's my hopeful scenario. That, and that's why I say this is hopefully going to be a 2021 event. But the final point is the path to getting there is not, you know, it's not a, a happy path because it's a path that assumes 20 to 30 percent of the U.S. population will have been infected with this. And there's going to be an extreme amount of death and disease that comes along with that, even with our ability to preserve life much more effectively now than where we were in March and April. Hmm. I have so many follow-up questions to you on that, but we're at the <laughs> at the time in our um, in our seminar when I need to switch over to the panel. So, um, Scott, any final thoughts you want to leave? You know, most important things we should be thinking about right now. Um, you know, just final thoughts on our conversation. My final thoughts are: I just it comes back to trying to um, mitigate the risk, and this just comes back to the simple things that we can do. And they, if we do them on a distributed basis, they're going to have a tremendous impact societally wearing masks when we're in public, you know, trying to avoid enclosed congregate settings, high risk settings, you know, hand hygiene is important. Fomites are probably less of a risk here than we first perceived, but it's still important. Simple things go a long way in public health, especially when they're practiced on a wide basis. All right. Well, thanks for being here with Good us. Class. I hope that your hopeful projections come true <laughs> and uh, everybody can tune in to CNBC and see Scott every day. Um, so do that. Thanks, Scott. All right, and everybody else, uh, our panelists, if you wouldn't mind turning on your cameras, unmuting yourselves, um, I'll introduce the group and, and we'll get started. Um, with us, we've got Dr. Antonio Andrew, uh, who's a scientific director of the European Infrastructure for Translational Research. Uh, we've got Dr. Mike Polini, who's managing partner at Section 32. Uh, Dr. Michael Sherman, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. 
uh, Werner Verbeest, Verbeest, apologies, <laughs> strategic partnerships and alliances leader at Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of J&J, &J, uh, and Dr. Jay Wigamuth, uh, tell me if I pronounce that wrong, um, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Quest Diagnostics. Did I do okay? Yeah, yeah, it, you did well, Mag, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Welcome. everyone. Apologies. Um, yeah, tough one. Well, I'm happy to, to get to see all of you. I wish it were in person. Um, you know, I thought it could be kind of interesting, actually, to hear from our, our folks in Europe. Um, we just had that conversation with Scott about the U.S. response. You know, I've been in my house since the middle of March. Basically, I go out for walks around the park with my toddler, but, but that's it. What's it been like uh, for you uh, where you are um, for the last six months? And, and now I understand, you know, especially in Spain, Tony, where you are, things are, are getting worse once again. Um, Tony, why don't we start with you? Just tell us about your experience and how it's really differed from what you've observed us doing here in the U.S. Yeah, well, I think that uh, I would, uh, if I have to find a word for uh, describing what happened in Europe, I would say just like lack of coordination, which is one of the, let's say, chronic problems of public health in Europe, because mm -hmm. we are a large community of 27 countries that they interact with each other constantly. And I think in terms of uh, policy making decisions from the perspective of public health, we work as completely compartmentalized spaces. And this has been a, this has been really an issue. And for instance, I can give you a pretty clear example at the beginning of the outbreak when the only um, available, let's say, uh, diagnostic text that we had for the screening uh, populations were the use of serologic tests. It was very clear that some countries were using some tests, uh, having evidence that those, that particular test was not working and that information was not being shared with other countries. So this created several, several problems. Um, I think at the beginning, we like in the US, we were not prepared for that, although we had clear, let's say, clear um, evidences that this was coming to us. Uh, after uh, the lockdowns and just the restrictive response that the public health authorities imposed in Europe, the situation, uh, you know, everybody felt that, we, um, that this was over, basically, but of course, um, the situation came back. And we were not aware that the virus is doing what the respiratory viruses do. They, mm -hmm. uh, they infect other people through uh, respiratory pathways uh, in, mechan in situations of socialization. So as we start socializing again, the infection rate starts increasing. Uh, Spain was particularly badly hit, as you know. Uh, I had the personal experience of working in nursing homes, which has mm -hmm. been, uh, I would say, a, a a, a life-changing uh, experience for me. Approximately 50% of the nursing homes in, uh, in Spain were affected uh, by the virus, 20% of mortality. And it was pretty terrible to see how, uh, you know, health workers, caregivers did not have access to PPEs, that you still have to provide care to people with very fragile conditions and the infections were, you know, spreading um, with no control. Uh, like in the U.S., we have learned a lot, I think, from the past experience. I think uh, I like pretty much uh, Scott's comments about prediction for the future, the combination of uh, changes in the social behavior, people being more cautious. In Spain now, wearing a mask is compulsory in all public spaces. And actually, it's quite interesting because you realize that after a while of living in a country where wearing a mask is compulsory and 100% people wear a mask, you know, walking on the street, on being in terraces in restaurants and so on. Suddenly you go to another country where this is not uh, still compulsory and you feel they're doing something wrong. You know what I mean? It's quite interesting. Um, well, uh, and also um, I think the public is much better informed now than they used to be in the past. I think there is an issue here about the role play by the media as a, you know, as a way to inform people because I think one thing is information and another thing is education and that's something that met i think is quite an interesting issue particularly for you know uh, deciding what we have to do in the future mm -hmm. and uh, we'll probably are you know are expecting that uh, the introduction of the of the vaccine will probably of course change our lives i would like also to add that i think it's another important element which has not been mentioned and i think it will play an important role which is the development of a rapid test because until now, uh, as you know, one of the 
big problems that we had at the beginning was the lack of uh, uh, availability for having access to PCR uh, based test um, and I think we need we need to develop for large screenings for when we you detect one particular case in one community trying to identify quickly how many people have been infected we need definitely uh, antigen, uh, rapid antigen based tests or we need to uh, adapt our PCR based tests using for instance saliva samples or something like that will make our life a little bit easier. Mm. Werner, how's it been in Belgium? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I just would I will add to what Tony was saying. I think in the beginning we saw a lot of uh, COVID um, nationalistic, protest protectionistic uh, um, atmosphere. But I think interesting is like the panel we have now here. Uh, scientists are above economic and political um, uh, levels. And, and, um, and w the positive uh, thing that I saw with the whole epidemic and pandemic is how scientists came together, uh, whether in academia, hospitals, in uh, industry. Uh, and, and, and we saw that on the national level, but also on European level, that where much more collaboration has started. Uh, there is, uh, for, for example, one of the largest European consortia on looking at um, existing treatments or existing molecules to look at whether they are active against COVID, but also have a, a platform for the future in, in trying to uh, share expertise uh, for um, uh, molecules and uh, treatments for the future, not only for Corona, but for future pandemics. Um, I think we, 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 don't have, we didn't have a handbook for what, what is happening, but I think we're getting closer there. Uh, another, another thing that I saw is that how industry has been supporting academic centers and hospitals to help to do, do testing. That's what we did, for example, in Belgium, but also in, in several other European countries where, where industry came together helping the, the government. Um, and sharing information, I think, uh, I think whatever is happening now, I think we all realize what is happening now in, in, um, in, in somewhere in, in Africa could affect uh, in something in, in Princeton and what happens in Boston could have an effect in, in, in somewhere else in the, in the, in the, um, on the globe. But I think having a, uh, I think a lot of people start to realize having a global monitoring system, tracking system, with diagnostic testing combined with digitalization, I think that really will be one of the lessons learned going forward because we will, we will have another uh, COVID-19 in the future. And as a planet, I think we will be much better prepared. I hope so. Um, so the, the focus of this part of our conversation is the development and deployment of tests, treatments, and vaccines. So maybe let's start with the, the testing part of this. And, Mike uh, Polini, we have two mics. Um, you know, we've talked about this a lot, and and I know you've done a lot of work on on how we can make this work. And, and Atul Gawande had a really great piece in the New Yorker uh, this week about our testing response, and he compared it the, the fragmented nature of it right now to um, where the electrical grid was before they really created a national plan. Um, how how would you assess where we are and and can it be fixed? Uh, well, if you want to know how I truly think, follow my Twitter account, Meg, as, as, uh, as I put some interesting things out there, especially in moments of true frust frustration. Uh, but listen, I, I think Atul's comments were spot on. Um, and it really goes to the heart of the diagnostic industry. Diagnostics fuels personalized medicine. Diagnostics, diagnostics fuels cancer care. Uh, it, it fuels so many of our medical decisions, and in fact, it should be fueling the work that we're doing around, uh, around managing COVID in this country. Um, but the bottom line is we haven't focused on it, and we haven't focused on an infrastructure that is well behind the infrastructure of therapeutics in this country and around the world. But I'll tell you, it's not that far behind the vaccine infrastructure, and what strikes me as you know, maybe more perplexing than anything else is that if we ask ourselves, if most of us ask our, ourselves, how much did we truly know about vaccines back in January of 2020? Even those of us in life sciences and biotech did not know a ton about vaccine development and vaccine distribution. So what did we do? Did we say, 
all right, the government, did the government say, okay, go figure it out, go figure out how to, how to make vaccines, come back to us when you have them ready, and when you're ready, we'll buy some from you. No, we did the exact opposite. We said we recognize that we don't have the vaccine infrastructure that is necessary to assist with this pandemic and hopefully nip it in the bud. So we didn't just double down, we probably quadrupled down with tens and even hundreds of billions of dollars ultimately going in this direction. We initiated Operation Warp Speed. And what's amazing to me is that we just elected not to do that with diagnostic testing. We pushed it out to the companies. I had an incredibly interesting conversation with the CEO of a major uh, antigen uh, uh, manufacturer uh, about a week and a half ago. And as we were having, we know one another, he was giving me, sharing me, sharing with me some uh, challenges that they faced and, but they are flat out with production. They're doing everything that they can do. The federal government is saying they're buying, they will buy every antigen test that they, that this company can produce and the others can produce. But then I said, let me ask you this question. What if back in February, the federal government came to you and pick a number, I'll pick $250 million and said, we are going to make an investment of $250 million in your company that you can utilize to push testing development at an accelerated pace. Would that have made a difference? And he sat back and he said, Mike, of course, it would have changed everything. We would have invested in a new facility. We would have hired new personnel. We would have done A, B, C, and D. That's exactly what's happened in therapeutics. That's exactly what's happened in vaccine development. We recognized where the shortcomings were. We invested in it as a country. And I believe at the end of the day, we'll have vaccines, antiviral therapies, um, and antibody therapies, which will make a meaningful difference. Yet the fourth leg of the stool has been largely ignored. So am I optimistic? I'm optimistic that folks that are on this call, Dr. Gottlieb, Rockefeller Foundation, and a lot of other really good people out there will continue to push on testing and tracing until we do make some progress. So that's where my optimism is today. Hmm. Well, Jay, I wonder if you can give us the perspective of, of the diagnostics industry or somebody who's working in it. Um, do you feel like, is the industry sort of an underdog to drugs and vaccines in terms of being appreciated for how important the what the products you have are? Uh, why do you think that is? Um, and just tell us about what it's been like really from your perspective in terms of the challenges you've had um, increasing your supply, your capacity, your you know, and decreasing your turnaround times. Right. Yeah, no, it's um, it's been a it's been a long year, uh, but we do actually just from the diagnostic industry standpoint feel that we've made a huge contribution. But to Mike's point, I think we learned an awful lot through the last you know this year, and and I do think one of the the biggest parts was uh, Werner was talking about a new um, spirit of collaboration in the country and between different parties. So I'll give you a good example about what we've learned. This time around, actually, Scott Gottlieb at the very start said, hey, Quest needs to get in the game. But the game was set up where we would have to work through a process where the CDC would first come up with an assay and then would, uh, would then hand it over. And I think we've all learned, including the collaboration we have with the CDC, that you know, Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp are outstanding at scaling up uh, testing rapidly, and we need to be on the front line of that um, when these things occur. So imagine in the future that we have a menu that has every scourge and every respiratory virus known to man or maybe still in animals, and we're in a tight collaboration with CDC that we have a handshake that one is coming over and on day one, we're at scale. And I, I do think that's what's going to happen. And I do think that, that this is a turning point because every four years or so, Quest has gone through to work on a pandemic threat. And every time it's been very similar. This time we busted through, I believe. And I, I think the CDC, I think the FDA, I think the industry is primed to do, you know, be much faster to get to scale next time. 
At the same time, I would say that the testing capacity issue that we have had as a country is now turning toward that antigen piece that I think um, Tony and others highlighted to say, okay, we have ample PCR capacity, but PCR is not the only tool that should be used to manage a pandemic of this nature. Uh, and so you're going to see that part developed. I totally agree with Mike's idea, though, that we sort of said, okay, let's warp speed on the therapeutics and let's cross our fingers on the diagnostics. And there was not a global, you know, a national coordinated strategy. We did coordinate well with the um, both the vice president's office and the CDC and FDA. So I feel like we've learned an awful lot this time, and it's going to be a fundamental change in how we, as a country, respond in the future. Mm. Well, Michael Sherman, uh, our other Michael, you guys are more of an innovative payer than really anyone else, but you know, payers play such an important role in, in healthcare in the United States. So just tell us about your perspective on what's gone right, what's gone wrong, what the biggest challenges are that you see right now. Yeah, and again, um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. We're trying to do our part to make things work, understanding that uh, to the earlier comments, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration. So a lot of it is even helping identify our members who are missing needed care or who may be at higher risk. We've done all sorts of things, sending out kits with masks and hand sanitizer and advice. Um, after we closed our offices uh, physically, like many in March, we actually turned the parking lot from one of our buildings into a testing facility. So we're really thinking hard how we can be part of the solution. Um, I think the challenges, though, are the incredible degree of confusion. I mean, even the data showing that 30% of people have said they would be reluctant to get a vaccine. Um, and that, that is if it were free and, and, and known to be eff efficacious. And so the added overlay, um, whether it's accurate or not, of the, being politicized with respect to when the vaccine would be available, doesn't help things. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that a lot of people stopped going to the doctor. We, we did our part. Uh, so in the spirit of being innovative, we said, let's not let uh, barriers to telemedicine exist. We said, we'll pay the docs the same as we would for an in-person visit, which we hadn't done before. And then uh, while we're at it, we just said we'd eliminate any cost share for the members. So our telemedicine uh, percent went up by about 8,000% increase, the, the utilization from February to about May, which was good. Now, interestingly, we've seen that come down somewhat as offices reopen, and we actually track claims, and we're seeing that uh, physicians' offices for commercial membership are actually pretty much back to normal based on claims volume, lagging a little bit more for the Medicare Advantage population. So we're trying to actually reach out both to the individuals and to physicians and point out what care has been missed that needs to happen. Um, because, well, we all know there have been unnecessary ER visits that haven't occurred, which is not a bad thing. Those moving to telemedicine. Medicine. We also know that people have been reluctant to go to ERs based on what we've seen in the news because, um, you know, uh, of the fear of getting infected, even when they've had chest pain, other things where they should be going. And when you look at avoided cancer screenings, um, postponed vaccinations, that's a concern. And if we don't get our act together and try to create incentives and information and support for closing those gaps, we're going to be seeing other problems. And again, as more than a few people have pointed out, going into a flu season um, together with the potential for pand pandemic uh, surges of COVID, I think is a bad combination. So, you know, again, I engage with the groups here from a health plan perspective and also through our industry association, trying to do everything we can to be supportive so that the cost of the vaccines and the diagnostics and the like are not barriers. But again, a lot of the challenges exist um, further back in the, in the supply chain. Again, the confusion and the differences even in different markets and states around who gets tested. I mean, early on, we, we were seeing um, cases where pe people in some states were getting tested just because they were concerned. And in, in certain Massachusetts hospitals, staff had exposures and were being sent home and said, don't, don't get a test unless you have symptoms because we're worried about the supply chain. I mean, we really shouldn't see those kind of differences. And as much as we're not going to have a national policy to Scott's comments, I think we need to let the science and, and data guide our actions. And that really shouldn't be different in different, uh, different markets. Mm. Uh, Tony, I wonder if we can come back to you. Um, thinking about this from, from a, well, the personalized medicine perspective and, and really understanding different um, 
reactions in different people in this disease. There's a lot of genetics work going on to try to understand if that can uh, give us any answers about why some people have severe disease and some people ha are asymptomatic. What's your perspective on the status of our understanding on that and, and how much research is going into that? And will we ever really understand it well? Well, I think, Meg, this is a key, key question. Uh, I think COVID-19 is a perfect example of the paradigm of personalized medicine. This is a personalized medicine issue because the big question mark here is that we do not understand is why a 95-year-old uh, person suffering from a cardiac and a respiratory chronic condition when he or she gets infected do not show any symptom at all and why a 25-year-old uh, male or female uh, trained, well-trained suddenly develops this terrible um, pulmonary inflammatory condition and eventually dies. This is the question. And, and I think uh, when we talk about personalized medicine, we have to keep in mind that personalized medicine is, let's say, an operational extension up to a certain extent of uh, genomic medicine and on the fact that at one day we were able to have a pretty good understanding of the human genome and then identify these individual genomic signatures. But uh, in the case of uh, infectious diseases, there is a secondary layer which goes beyond the genome which is the development of the immune system. So obviously uh, we have a personalized medicine approach, much more complex than the strictly genomic approach that goes uh, points to the fact that we need to understand the immune response and the immunoprofiling um, biomarker signatures of patients that have been infected by COVID-19. There is a lot of uh, research along this way. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, to do and to identify these individual biomarkers, most of them are going to be immune-related molecules or immune-related responses that will define uh, profiles of risks in these patients, most likely, in a complex way. But to do that and to do that uh, um, properly, we need uh, cooperation. We need to have large data set. We need to share data from multiple cohorts because that's the only way to have a proper high quality stratification that will uh, help us to have a better understanding, a predictive perspective of the development of these, of these patients. COVID-19, uh, I think up to a certain extent, could be a, a kind of a very special moment for the development of personalized medicine, because we have the opportunity of having a much more, uh, let's say, aggressive approach to our understanding of the biology going beyond the genome. Hmm. Well, Werner, I wonder if I can ask you um, about your perspective on, on that data generation um, and the, the collaboration that, that we're seeing. You know, there's been a lot of praise of the UK's approach in the recovery trial and making the discovery about dexamethasone and, you know, a lot of criticism that we hear about the US approach maybe being too splintered and not running these trials in the same way to really get the same kinds of answers. Um, and of course, the US not really participating as much in the WHO's organized efforts. Uh, how would you characterize the sort of global collaboration and the status of data generation and sharing? Um, well, well, I think it's, I mean, you have, as I said earlier, you have these political drivers and I think that will be a reality for all of us going forward, uh, especially on your side of the ocean then for the next months. But uh, I really believe again that the, 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 the scientists and um, wherever they are, uh, I've seen it personally in the field of HIV, I see it now happening again in the field of COVID-19, how scientists come together. Um, and I see also, for example, in, in the development of vaccines, I know that the, all the vaccine developers, they have regular contacts with each other. They have a regular um, pl a platform where they share data on information. I think in on the diagnostics, go, going back to what Mike and, and Jay have said earlier, I think, it's incredibly to see how everybody knows what, what is a diagnostic. My, my mother is 88 in a care center. She knows now what is a PCR. 
uh, my three kids, they ask me how, what's happening on the vaccine, <laughs> Werner. So it's incredible how this pandemic has really enabled a lot of flaming people to understand what are diagnostics, what are vaccines, what are therapeutics. And I think that really, I believe that force of the people is going to drive a lot that collaboration. Um, so um, going back to yeah, your specific question, I think there the, um, you see on a, on a European level, there are more consortia uh, built. I think um, the personalized medicine coalition here, I mean, I've been from the beginning of the pandemic in contact with different board members, uh, Mark Stevenson, Turner Fisher and, and other members uh, to share information, to share how we can collaborate. And all of that, we have done that above in fact the the borders of the existing or the existing walls or the existing silos that exist so um so i'm i'm very positive minded very positive that that i see different changes in in the way um things are organized and i think but still believe like platforms like uh the platform we have here but also who and others are going to use this pandemic as a as a stimulus to to really reorganize and have a new uh, a new sense of uh, purpose and a new way of uh, operating. Mm. Well, I want to bring it back to the diagnostics questions uh, and and take it back to Mike. Um, is it a pipe dream for us to have daily home easy to take coronavirus tests that everybody can have access to and take as much as we need to? Not even close to being a pipe dream, Meg. It's if we put our minds to it, um, which the companies are doing, right? The, the manufacturers, the labs, everyone's really heading in this direction. That's where innovation is going. There's nothing that's incredibly complicated about this technology that suggests that we can't all have a home test. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, uh, you know, you had a, ibuprofen was a prescription. Pepsid was a prescription. You couldn't go to the pharmacy and just pick it up at your convenience, which we can do now or have it delivered home at, at one's convenience. Um, so things change. What's up to us and where we could use some assistance from the federal government is to help us make this change even faster. So we know that there will be hundreds of millions of home, um, I'm sorry, hundreds of millions of antigen tests produced in the United States alone in 2021. We might get to 200 million produced between now and the end of, of this year. So not all of them are designed for in-home testing, but there certainly are a number of tests which could in fact be deployed at home. So we can't put the onus just on the manufacturers to do that, to, to drive them home. But if there was a coordinated effort to work with the government, to work with the FDA, and to establish guidelines for in-home testing, we could get there much faster. All we, we've, um, uh, we've mentioned antigen testing several times on the call. So it's, as we think about testing for COVID, let's put, the, let's put testing in two buckets. You're sick and you need a clinical diagnostic test, think PCR. Sorry about that, phone rang. <laughs> think PCR. If for asymptomatic screening to assess populations, perhaps for schools, for businesses, think antigen-based tests. We could go much deeper in each of those areas. But these antigen tests, in order to be, in order to be broadly, in order to be broadly, really to talk up, to you. That's, that's remarkable. <laughs> uh, in order to be broadly deployed, can't be at $100. Because Michael Sherman is not going to pay, I hope it's not an emergency. Michael <laughs> Sherman, for example, is not going to pay for 200 million uh, tests at $100 each. However, and we shouldn't expect payers to do that, let them take care of the sick population. But if we have 10 to $15 and perhaps $5 home tests what, for, for antigen testing, what the data now clearly shows, whether it's out of the Larimore group, what we see coming out of Harvard, is that if we can do daily home testing, we can actually reduce the numbers from 100% to close to zero in terms of new transmission. If we go out to every three days, we can actually reduce transmission by 80% in a rapid time period. And as we lessen the frequency and increase the interval of testing, what happens is that the disease burden stays higher, the transmission rate stays higher. So we can drive towards home testing. 
we still need the laboratory-based testing. That is a critical piece of what we're working on here, but it must be complemented, I think, by easier to use inexpensive home testing if we're really going to get to the point that, that Scott mentioned in the last presentation for 2021. There's no reason we can't get there. Well, Michael Sherman, I'll ask your perspective on that from, from the payer's point of view. I mean, do you agree that, that you would only cover the tests for sick people or is there you know, a role for payers to, to subsidize the cost of tests to keep people healthy? A great question. And you know, again, I generally um, am in violent agreement with Mike. A couple of, of additional points I would make. First, um, th this short term is extraordinary, and um, I think not indicative of how we normally operate. I mean, you report on CNBC um, some, um, probably not the right word coming from a payer, but I've seen profit margins from publicly traded payers uh, because the avoided care has been greater in magnitude than the additional cost of COVID. Um, and again, we're, we're not for profit, so we're doing everything we can to spend money to help with the problem. So in, in the short term, it's not a barrier. Longer term, I would remind everyone that when, when things normalize, that when, when costs go up, someone's paying for it. Um, generally, we shoot for you know percent uh, profit margin. So it, if we're not paying for it, everyone is. So there's still the question of broad affordability. And if you think, and Mike understands this, if you think about what we need to be doing in terms of volume of testing, just as to support it as a nation, whether it is for individuals, employers, schools, Medicaid, et cetera, it probably does need to be at a much lower price point than $100. Um, right now, if there are tests available, we're going to do everything we need to to cover them, period. But again, there's that longer term sustainability issue. I'd, I'd also um, remind you know, uh, the participants uh, that for employers, and many of them are looking at doing testing for entering buildings and other things, all of which are appropriate. But keep in mind, insurance in most cases doesn't cover employer screening. And even uh, if it were to, um, half the employers in the country, or even a little bit more in some markets are self-insured. So they're covering it directly. And we also know that, that employers are suffering. I'd also remind everyone that we're seeing millions of individuals, and some data has come out on this, who are moving off of the um, employer insurance roles and uh, frequently onto Medicaid and exchange populations, which is where it becomes the state's problem. And again, we know that the states are challenged in this time of COVID. And then finally, um, there, you know, even though we have um, a large proportion of our population insured, thank God, particularly at a time like this, there are many individuals, particularly from people of color and other um, other um, diverse populations who are less likely to have coverage and who also need access to tests. So for all those reasons, we need um, something at an affordable price point that works for all parties. And again, it also needs to work, just to be clear, for the manufacturers, they need to have the incentive to put, put resources into this and to focus. So it, really, everyone needs to, to be benefiting. Mm -hmm. Well, Jay, I wonder if I can ask you to weigh in on the landscape and, and the, the, the regulation around diagnostics. There, without getting too much into the weeds, although I, I suspect the audience here likes being in the weeds, um, there was yeah. the regulatory change recently about laboratory developed tests, LDTs, where the FDA wouldn't necessarily have oversight over them anymore. How does that affect the the environment um, in diagnostics? You know, we've just seen this pendulum swing from being so restrictive for diagnostics to being, you know, very constrictive, and now maybe swinging back too far the other way. How, how do you look at it? Yeah, I, I think what's happening there, or just through the pandemic, is a change in the view of the role of the large laboratories in being able to rapidly bring tests to market. And I think in this in this case, um, it feels like the pendulum swung back um, in the direction you're saying because of the belief that um, a Quest or a LabCorp or a Mayo or ARUP can rapidly bring up high quality tests. And if we are in a situation where there's a prolonged regulatory review from the FDA, which is above and beyond the current regulatory system for labs, um, it creates a barrier. Um, and, and so we're trying to find a happy medium to say labs need to be able to move fast to bring the right test to market. And at the same time, there needs to be proper regulatory oversight. And what is the sweet spot? And I think we're finding our way through the pandemic, um, which is one of the things that has changed. I, I want to talk about another thing that's changed that, that Michael 
was bringing up. And I, I think this is probably the bigger, longer term dynamic, which is we have the worst health care crisis in the history of forever for this country. Right. And in March and February, the the advice was stay at home and don't go to a physician office or health system to get your test done. But yet we got to get this test done somehow and everyone needs it. So what's the best way to deal with that? The best way to deal with that is people need testing in their home and not just for this, but for influenza. And to Michael's point, we see diabetes uh, testing rates way down and that's because people are on lockdown orders. And so the thing I want to just say here is this is, this is something that has been needed in our healthcare system forever is an embracing of bringing consumer healthcare to that person's home. And so now, you know, just as we go through this, we of course, uh, Quest in particular, we developed home-based PCR kits for COVID. Totally agree with Mike, it's just a matter of time. There will be home-based antigen kits available. But then if I'm in the home there and telemedicine laws have opened up and, and cancer screening rates are down, I also wanna do a colon screening test. And I also, if I'm a consumer, I don't wanna drive over to the health system to get that done. Um, so I think there's a big change in healthcare that's happening right now around that. And we're gonna ride it out through this pandemic, but it's gonna be a lasting change in, in the way that we, the labs and the whole system delivers healthcare. So silver lining, you know, around um, how this has changed the, the system. Hmm. Well, just a follow up on the, the home testing and how, how much is your offering, is Quest's offering for home administered tests being used right now? And do you have to do the really deep swab up to your brain? Yes, uh, no, you don't. Um, and of course I have a swab here, but it's just a little Q-tip that will go in the front of your nose. I'm not gonna demonstrate, okay? This is the type of swab that would be used and it's an anterior nerve, not a deep brain biopsy. And that the, the field collectively, including our scientists and many others in different companies have shown that the anterior nerves, the non-invasive approach is pretty good. It's very good. You get good sensitivity. And so these kits, um, you, so Quest is a largest provider of COVID laboratory testing but we also provide uh, testing to employers and universities, and we're actually the largest provider of point of care testing in the country. And so, yes, we will be, uh, we're vetting and working through the different kits that are out there. We believe that there are high quality kits. And to Mike's point, it is, you know, we're working hard to make those available in the right setting. And I think the right setting is mostly gonna be the screening to Mike's point. So if you're, di if you're symptomatic or you're high risk, you probably need a PCR. And I'm not just saying that because I offer PCR. Um, we would also, though this would be a huge tool, Mike, um, to really uh, get the pandemic under control and empower people in their own homes to get rapid results or at the gate of the ball game or on the way into the nursing home. So I think this is a big deal and it's a matter of time. Hmm. Uh, Tony, I, I wonder if I can bring you back into the conversation. Do you have thoughts on where we stand on therapeutics? Uh, you know, we've repurposed some medicines to some success. Um, now we are starting to see novel drugs for the coronavirus advancing through the clinic. Um, Merck has a small molecule. Um, Pfizer has a, an antiviral it's developed that it's just be bringing into the clinic. And of course, there are antibody drugs as well. How optimistic are you about what you're observing uh, from these medicines and um, when they might be available, what role they might play? Yeah, well, I have to say I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I think there are several clinical trials uh, that are going on. Uh, of course, a little bit of early days. And as you mentioned, uh, we definitely have to take uh, repurposing strategies because, you know, the possibility of uh, identifying drugs through a screening of libraries could be a potential uh, important source for therapeutic solutions for COVID-19. This is going to happen. I think 2021 is going to be a key, a key year, and probably there is going to be a lot of action uh, in drugs specifically addressed for managing complications of COVID-19. Because we are at the, let's say, the first chapters of this story. And there is no question that one of the big uh, challenges that we are going to have is the 
long-term consequences of the disease and the clinical management of the endothelial disease, which is the one that is going to provoke, let's say, the most damaging, the most damaging part. Yeah, 2021, I think, is going to be a critical year. And I think that uh, policymakers should make an effort in trying to help the scientific community to develop report processing strategies using the uh, molecules that are already available and possibly some of them will be effective for COVID-19. No question about that. Mm. Well, Werner, I wonder if you can give us the perspective from a company, you know, in the midst of working on a vaccine. Uh, the latest guidance I think we've received from J&J &J is that it plans to begin phase three trials potentially in late September. Um, the company, I think, you know, took us a longer approach to get into phase one than other companies did, but now you're moving really, really fast. Um, just tell us about how it feels inside the company, um, what role you envision J&J's vaccine potentially playing, and, and, and the decisions that the company appears to be making, which I observe from the outside um, as being a little bit different. You know, I've heard um, Paul Stoffels, your chief scientist, say that the phase three trials might be as many as 60,000 people, which is much more than we hear from other companies. So first of all, I'm, I'm, I know what is being said in the public, but I also know internally what, what, what's happening. And uh, so I'm, I'm not uh, the, the vaccine expert, but uh, definitely, I mean, first of all, everybody is very excited in the company that we, we can contribute there. I, I believe that uh, uh, we will need notable vaccines. So I, I just heard today there are 250 companies working on a vaccine. And usually of the 250, I would expect 10 to to be in a phase two, phase three. Um, I th indeed, I think uh, what I've heard is the team have been working extremely hard on getting the phase one, two, three, all almost in a parallel way. So when when the phase one started in, in healthy volunteers already, phase two was on, almost starting, and then and now we're in phase two, looking at uh, at uh, different doses, but also at uh, different ages between 18, 55, and then 65 plus a separate study. And then we're, we're expecting interim results this month. Uh, and then uh, parallel already phase three will be being prepared uh, to look at either at the people with active infection, uh, where single dose could be uh, looking at an immune response with an immune in active infection and the other study will be in fact in more uh, in a prophylactic indication so um, um, all of that i think you you're right i think it's uh, with the plans of an emergency use authorization potentially all depending on, on safety and efficacy later this year beginning of next year and th that is the the planning i think i believe indeed that the numbers uh, are of the phase three, in fact, uh, 60,000 and a 30,000 uh, patient study. And um, I mean, you know Johnson & Johnson as well. We're, uh, we're, we, take, um, we, we want to take more time to do it right. And, and, uh, but I, I think I, I, I support Scott there. In fact, what he said earlier, the emergency use authorization, I see it as well here in, in, the, in the layman's information. People will be afraid that it will not be at the same quality or the same standards. I was, and I definitely convinced that, that all the companies that are going through the different stages are, are using all high, it's going just, it's going very fast. It just, we will have less information on, on, the, on the longer term, but I think all the, we have the, the biomarkers, we have uh, neutralization antibody information and others. So I think that will be crucial. And we don't know everything again, as we go through this, uh, we, we need to learn more. We have learned about PCR. <clears throat> we learned that the, even people now who have a positive PCR uh, could be, in fact, um, non-infectious. We, we don't know everything about the, the titers of the antibodies. So I think it's really going back to the, what I said, the data sharing across the industry, across all the scientists, the whole community. Uh, that will be critical in making uh, progress. Mm. Uh I want to sort of, one theme I'm picking up on from everybody in the conversation is that we are potentially in a sort of catalytic moment for good change to various different systems in healthcare. Uh, Michael Sherman, I want to come back to you. Um, 
you know, one of the changes that you talked about was a use of telemedicine. And I think that really goes into what Mike Pellini and, and Jay were, were saying about more home care. How much of that use of telemedicine and home-based care do you think stays with us? Um, and, and are incentives going to be in place by payers and by the government, by anybody else who can, who can affect that change to, to uh, affect good change in that way? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, um, you know, so th this has been a great experiment. And I think we're all learning a lot, including learning what type of visits work and what don't work. So, um, and that's clearly going to play into our policies. Um, what what it, I would suggest is that we're going to see telemedicine visits level off at a far higher point than previously um, uh, with a great better understanding of that question. So for example, um, you know, my own daughter had a telemedicine asthma visit and it was a hybrid visit. They did that part with a physician um, online and then they sent her in for some pulmonary function testing, you know, at the pulmonary lab at the hospital. So I think we're, you know, it's not either or, I think it's going to be a blended model in many cases. I do believe that the payers and, um, and other stakeholders will continue to create incentives, uh, which, which likely will include um, what they've done around the cost shares, uh, maybe not zero dollar cost share going forward because that could skew um, and you know, cause people only to go with virtual visits when that might not be the right thing, but certainly something that is um, that creates an incentive and also thinking about paying more to the providers than previously. So I do think those things will persist. The other thing that's interesting is if you think about it, the technology existed previously and we had offered telemedicine visits and our, our uptake was in the uh, single digit percentage so we didn't see as much as you might think, despite all of the talk publicly about telemedicine. And, you know, it, 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 so again, it took a crisis to bring that to the forefront. I would also point out that a number of provider groups, you know, either did not have the infrastructure in place or, um, or had it, but didn't really want to activate it or preferred for financial or other reasons to think about driving in in-person care. And it's really interesting. So that, that was one of the, um, arguments against telemedicine that why it can't happen, the infrastructure piece. And it is amazing within several weeks of um, essentially seeing in-person visits shut down for all but the worst emergencies, how quickly the provider systems did put in place the technology offerings. Again, either through systems that they had themselves or were tied to their EHR or through third-party platforms. So the fact that this has pushed us uh, to that point where we now have a greater comfort level, I think is is um, going, it's going to persist. And then we, um, like many, are trying to better understand the, the use of technology, not just for virtual visits, uh, looking at one another, but to whom do we give connected asthma uh, monitors or blood pressure cuffs or others? And uh, that's an open question, but the data that we're collecting is going to be really powerful. We also are fortunate to have an institute, which includes the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard Medical School. So we explicitly have, have funded them to do research on these kind of questions, understanding the impact of COVID on telemedicine, on, on loss of, of insurance benefits, et cetera. And that type of, of structured data is going to be really impactful for us and for others who are part of the healthcare delivery system. Hmm. Well, Mike and Jay, you know, your, your conversation earlier, thinking about bringing things into the home, you know, it started to make me think this is the domain oftentimes of tech companies, you know, like Amazon. And you know, there were some rumblings early on about Amazon's potential role here in the testing world. And we haven't really heard much from them. I mean, Mike, what are your thoughts about the role of sort of non-traditional tech companies getting into healthcare and, and helping sort of speed this change? change along? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic question. And I want to say, you know, Michael's overview of where this world is heading, uh, at least from my perspective, appears spot on. The technology, the new technology that I see every day that's really supporting parts of this aspects of this transition from a provider's perspective, from a patient pers patient's perspective, from a payer's perspective is, uh, is, is, is you know, it, it's just growing. The opportunity is growing every single day. Um, in terms of the large tech companies, I agree with you. Early on, Amazon was, you know, they were they were front and center in the testing uh, in the testing world. I think what happened though is they maybe opted for some partnerships and they opted to focus on they recognized the magnitude of the challenge for their own employee base. So rather than solving the challenge for the world, they recognized they need to solve the challenge for Amazon because Amazon, let's face it, is driving a large part of our economy today. 
And I would say the same is true for Apple and same is true for, for some of the other large tech companies, including Google. Google has done a lot of work on the lab testing side, uh, but they're not, they don't have the ability to impact the nation, for example, the way a Quest or LabCorp might or one of the major manufacturers might. So I think they're focused on areas, on areas that they could control. But what I'm seeing much more of today, Meg, are people that are leaving these tech organizations and they're migrating over much more frequently into, into this healthcare world because they see the opportunity, not as some abstract idea, well, we can take this idea and technology and apply it to healthcare, but things are really happening today. You know, we brought, at our fund, we brought on a couple of very senior recruiters out of the tech world. And uh, it's amazing, the op for, and not for us, but we did it for all of our companies. It's amazing the number of pull through that we're seeing, especially with some of the cutbacks uh, in the tech world. So. I think this landscape is changing. Michael described it extremely well. I'm still a little bit worried about kind of, you know, organizations like AMA, state medical societies. I see them fighting some of this change. They're a little bit worried about it. They're conservative. Um, but, you know, with what I, some of the steps from the payers, some of the steps from the regulators, and then I think just the, 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 the eyes wide open approach that patients and providers, healthcare providers now have is going to cause uh, a continued shift in this direction. And I think we're fortunate that we're gonna to start to pull more and more tech employees into the healthcare world. And unlike 10 years ago, where it was a bit more abstract, I think they can really have an impact today because we just understand this connection a bit better than we did in the past. It's a good point. I, uh, I had an experience with that recently. I was doing some home testing through this company called Vault Health, which uses the Rutgers saliva test. And I did a story about the company and the CEO turned out to have worked at Amazon. Um, and this is a company that you, know, you do this at home saliva collection and then they overnight the test back and forth to the lab and you get your results within two to three days of it getting back to the lab. So it just felt very Amazon to me. Um, <laughs> Jay, I wonder if, you know, I can ask you the same question. Do you see the diagnostics industry really, really at a moment of change? Um, I, I thought what you said at the beginning about um, being sort of pandemic ready uh, in terms of having tests, you know, sort of ready to go um, was just really fascinating. And so how do you see the industry being different after this, uh, if you do, and are new players potentially going to come in that you could partner with even? Right, right. And, and this, let, let me go back to that concept because it does bring in the Amazons and the tech leaders of the world. I, I would say we absolutely will, Quest and other labs, be in a totally different position. I know right now that there are 60 respiratory viruses out there, and I know that there are nine that could come over. And in fact, working with um, Boston Children's and Amazon Web Services, we want to have a surveillance system that tells us that H5N1 is coming over right now through Asia, and here it is on the United States. And Therefore, this test we have for H1N1 needs to be scaled up post-haste. And that's all actually happening. And that's really sort of exciting to me to see it because a year ago, I would have never thought that I could say, we're going to have something, we'll have a surveillance system and we will be ready with assays and then we will scale it up much faster. And I, I just think that that's because of the Werner effect. Um, the universal law, law of science, which is scientists love to work together. Actually, the lab core CMO is on my speed dial now. Um, you know, unbelievable things have happened in the way we're working together. Uh, and some of these relationships with the big tech are now happening. So we work very closely with Verily. And, and in fact, that's not abstract. So they have really great tools um, that are on the front end of COVID testing and, te and contact tracing and, and all the software needed. And they recognize that Quest Diagnostics is needed to drive that volume of testing, you know, at scale. So that's kind of a real time thing that's happened. Last year, I didn't, I wasn't connected to AWS. I wasn't connected to Google. And now we're really working together trying to figure out, well, what, because these are very powerful companies with great tools. So, so I, I think they're definitely now in more of our traditional space and we're working together collaboratively. But I also do think, um, you know, to Michael's point and Mike's point, you know, the technology is all there. There is no question we can do telemedicine. There is no question. So I think in a lot of it is the change that has to happen in the healthcare system. 
the incentives have to change to make it so that all of us embrace the low-cost home-based approach. But it's, it's happening fast, and I think the big tech will be there as a part of it, and a lot of innovative new technology companies, but the, the, the tools are available now. So that it's really the change in the system that has to happen. And Meg, I would just add that the irony in the situation is that despite the isolation that we all face, and we all face it in some form or another, the communication has actually improved. Maybe not within companies sometimes, because that's become more difficult, but the communication between companies and even companies that used to be in different universes is now much improved. And I think there is a fundamentally different understanding and perhaps more important than understanding, respect for one another. You know, for example, Google Verily, understanding and respecting the strengths of the Quest and vice versa. AWS, understanding the strengths of a different organization and back and forth. And I think that will, that is the, you know, I wouldn't trade it if offered the choice, but that is the silver lining to what we are seeing in 2020. And I think we'll emerge much, much better off in the long run because of this. Mm, I hope so. That's why I was calling you earlier, Michael, uh, just to <laughs> kind of, you know, get in your way a little bit. Three times. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm just about to hand it back over to Ed to, to wrap up, but I wonder if I can have kind of a rapid fire round with everybody. Final thoughts. Um, I'll ask everybody two questions. One is top of your wish list for the problem you could have solved right now that you think would make the biggest difference in, in getting us out of this. And the second one is the date you think things go back to normal in the normal that Scott Gottlieb described. So maybe we're still hesitant to shake hands or crowd into an elevator, but our kids are going to school, we're going to work. Um, Tony, let's start with you. Yeah, I think at the top of my wish list is uh, strength and cooperation and data sharing. I think we, this is the moment for science, but science with capital C. And there is a particularly important moment in which academia and the private sector and the industry will uh, really kind of join forces for, you know, for identifying the right tools for uh, solving this, uh, this problem. And, uh, and uh, about uh, when things are going back to normal, I, I, I fully agree with uh, Scott that 2021 is going to be the kind of the critical year and the beautiful combination of uh, increasing the consciousness of the population, um, improving the diagnostic tests, having a more clear understanding from public health about the right decisions that have to be made will improve significantly uh, our social life. Mm. Uh, Werner, how about you? I will be short, yeah. Uh, I, a global monitoring system, I think it's uh, linked between the diagnostics and home testing, uh, central app, and then the di digitalization of that. I think we didn't talk about that a lot, but I think the connectivity of everything with the diagnostics, that is going to be incredibly important. And um, back to, I think you have Labor Day coming. Well, Labor Day 21. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I like your specificity. Uh, and in order, I'm literally just going across my screen, so it has no rhyme or reason to it. But Michael Sherman, you're next. Yes. So um, on my wish list, uh, let's stop politicizing the discussion. Um, let's be about the data, about the information, uh, and let that speak for itself. Um, in terms of um, when I think we'll be back to normal, I think we'll have a vaccine in early 2021, but it will take a while for that to be available for all beyond the first responders and other key groups. So I think we are looking at Q3 before enough individuals have gotten the vaccine based upon willingness and, and supply before we are essentially in a normal state. Mm. Mike Polini. Yeah, I, I, I think the challenge is that um, the thing that we're all hoping for is perhaps the most difficult to get um, uh, with what we're facing with the federal government. And that is we need meaningful and consistent engagement from the federal government because we don't need it at the science level, but we need it to accelerate what everyone is pushing so hard for. And we need that consistent messaging. So that, that's certainly the top of my wish list, and it's been there since uh, the end of January. Um, I think, but Q3 2021. So whether it's Labor Day, uh, plus or minus, uh, yes, Q3 2021, we'll start to get a sense that we're entering a new normal. All right, and Jay. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the spring uh, this coming spring with the caveat that the, that it is a new normal and that the the main issue right now is uncertainty, 
And if we can get to a place where we are certain that a vaccine is here and that it's coming through the population and we understand that epidemic and it's not going to be the same. And by the way, it varies as much here in California as it does over in Europe between the way different communities act and think. But I'm, I think we get to a place where we have some certainty about what the future looks like. And then my, I want everything the, everyone said. I also want our kids at school. I really do. I think it's a, a real problem over time, and we just got to keep working really hard to get that over this hump the next few months, get kids in school. Mm, that could be a whole hour and a half long panel in itself. How did you <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. I well, everybody, this has been so interesting for me, and I hope for, for the audience as well. And Ed, I'm, I'm sorry, as a TV reporter, I feel ashamed I went over by, by four minutes to my allotted hey, time. I, I just want to thank you so much for your expert uh, questions and uh, uh, helping us sort out some of these very important issues. I'm sure the audience uh, enjoyed it. And I'd also like to thank our panelists uh, from the PMC board. And finally, uh, thank the people who uh, helped put this uh, uh, seminar on. Uh, it, there was a lot of optimism. Um, I could just lay, say in conclusion um, from this panel to God's ears. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Ed. Thanks, Thanks Meg. <laughs> See you guys. Bye -bye.